Welcome to SciShow Tangents. It's the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green. Joining me this week, as always, is our science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. But you know what Sam Schultz isn't <laughs> ignorant of? Hmm? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Don't. Don't do this to me. <laughs> the Vampire Diaries. Uh, Can you no, explain no, to me no. how the vampires work in the Vampire Diaries? Well, they used they at the beginning of the show, in the first like season Like normal vampires? The show, they can, have, they go out um, in, can they go out in the sunlight? They need a magic ring to go out in the sunlight. Grain? So, no, no, a magic ring. ring. A ring, a ring. A ring, a ring. Yeah. You know, oh, they eat like, a piece so. of toast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they need a magic <laughs> grain. That would actually be really cool. It's, it's quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, when you first meet uh, Stefan Salvatore, the main vampire of the show, he's got uh-huh. this big, ugly ring on. Oh, uh, he can go outside. That's what he needs to go outside. It's a daylight ring. And a witch has to make it for you. And eventually everybody just has one. Oh, it's okay. It's not just like one. You can get more. So no, it's not like the Highlander where you have to like stab Stefan Salvatore to get the ring. Well, in the first season, that is kind of the way it is. Okay. There's like, there's only two and it's like, oh, we need these rings. But then like the next few seasons, it's just like, oh yeah, my necklace is So one. they're just people who drink <laughs> blood now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they like garlic? Uh, yeah, they can eat garlic. That's a very specific. There's a scene where where Stefan's cutting garlic, and he's like, "I love Italian food." <laughs> <laughs> so that was made up. Yeah, that you disregard made up. that piece. Of they the can't war. turn into okay. bats, which is really dumb. I think they should be able to turn into bats. I think that that's like the coolest vampire power. I think. Yeah, but it's really hard. I understand turning into a cloud of bats, but yeah. turning into one bat—that's just against. Oh, it's all hard scientifically. Science. I thought you meant. Yeah. Like, I thought you meant like the graphics would be hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just conservation of matter is kind of a big deal. You'd be one really heavy bat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, a large it's, bat. It's the, yeah, it's just all the protein. It's like a neutron star <laughs> inside of the bat. Yeah, infinitely <laughs> dense bat. It's like, yeah. yeah. Perfect. You've solved the problem. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do, so they do drink blood. Yeah. Do they kill people? Oh, all the time. There's some okay. of them that drink blood so hard that they make the head pop off of the person whose blood they're drinking. That's not how that works. They're called rippers. They suck so hard that it just goes whoop. Or do they bite into Who really could say? <laughs> but they, they're gone. they grab a person, they bite, and then at the end of the biting, their head just pops right off their body. It's really cool, actually. But they're bad vampires. We don't like them. <laughs> Because so they make the heads gets, pop off instead of yeah. just killing. There are good and bad nice. vamp. So is there like there are there some like Lestat who just like uh, stumble around the streets of of Paris, France, and chew the heads off of rats? Uh, oh yeah, that's Stefan. He's like that, except oh, he's okay. secretly a ripper and he can't control himself. So he has to drink animal blood because if he gets one drop of human blood he'll go nuts and he'll start popping people's heads off does he pop oh, animals no. heads off no but, he can drink that stuff normal he could like eat a cow it's not like good stuff, stuff yeah. just like yeah. just like mice with just boom 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 yeah you're shotgunning mice and their heads are just flying out there yeah these are all better <laughs> ideas than the vampire diary explorers <laughs> <laughs> is it like the princess diaries no they write in a diary like one time in the first episode and then then that's there's no just diaries it. after that. There's a few, and every like once a season, somebody will write. Dear in a diary. diary, I love garlic. Pop, pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are you asking me about this to make me embarrassed? <laughs> <laughs> no, you seem to know a lot. I I've, do. I, I I feel like I should be aware of how it works. It's a good show. It's an everyman okay. sort of knowledge, I think. Then there's werewolves too. We haven't gone into the werewolves. Do they also drink blood? No. They do they also food. pop heads off? They could if they wanted to. Then there's half wolf, half vampire. They can do what? all. They can do all of the above. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Are there witch wolf vampire? No, you can't be magi- You can't be magical and be a vampire or a wolf. Oh, that's a okay. rule. That's, that's a, a real rule. rule. Yeah. If you okay. get turned into one of those, you lose your magic. Except Stefan's mom. <laughs> <laughs> there's always what? one. Who- Spoilers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gonna warm up for Halloween, guys. Yeah, we're getting we're in the spirit. Ready. So every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts and vampire diaries facts while also <laughs> trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, and I'll be awarding those as we play. So at the end of the episode, one of them can be crowned the winner. But as always, we gotta introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week, it's from me. <coughs> oh, <laughs> A treat. A treat. For the for the people who aren't uh, watching on video, you, you only know that the treat made a number of noises. <laughs> yeah. 
A thing we've known through modernity Atoms are unchanged for eternity Even when they change their chemicals <gasps> An oxygen is oxygen And hydrogen is hydrogen Always the same, they never change Whoa, but then they do Big atoms can decay From one element to another cascade Particles emitted, they're emitted Particles emitted, they're emitted Whoa, oh, oh, they're radioactive Radioactive, whoa they're radioactive, <laughs> radioactive. No one tell Imagine Dragons. We didn't get Please the rights to the song. Please don't tell on us. We'll get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to say that was really cool, but you have to be kind of secretive about it. On the uh, yeah, yeah. When you're tweeting about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> the topic for the day is radioactive. Specifically, <laughs> I could have kept going because there's other kinds of radioactive, I feel like. You're saving that for your new album, right? But I got to save it for the new album. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think you committed a crime that Weird Al doesn't commit, where Weird Al changes the uh, the 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 chorus. I think that's where you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> I changed the chorus. What is it? They're not. I'm. They're radioactive. Oh, see. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <I see. laughs> so our topic for the day is radioactive. Sari, what does radioactive mean? Did I get everything in my? 85 word song i mean you got the gist of it which is all we can ever hope to do with this definition okay. section mm-hmm. so uh radioactivity is just radiation emitted by a radioactive material and that can be lots of different forms it can be alpha particles beta particles <laughs> neutrons <laughs> and these, are, these are specific things well, yeah one of those things is like a high energy electron maybe or photon yeah. or what are they beta particles are electrons that are not attached to atoms so like spinning out an electron alpha particles are the yep. chunky ones so they're uh two protons two neutrons oh so are big big boys big large boys large. that's basically a that's basically a nucleus at that point yes basically like a little bigger than a high that's uh, like a helium-ish size yeah it's thing. a helium nucleus that's yeah. an alpha particle the giant one uh mm-hmm. beta particles are like spewing out a little electron the third is a neutron which is like a hydrogen kind of a little smaller, but spewing that out. And then there's electromagnetic radiation, which is like right. X-rays, gamma rays, visible light. The, and that's just like light. Yeah. Light, yeah. Light and different and but gamma rays are like light that'll that'll do you a damage. Yeah, there's light that will not <laughs> do you damage, and then there is light that is high energy enough that mm-hmm. can, it'll a, get in there. We can get into Hulk. Atoms and exactly. molecules, yeah, and start yeah. messing things up and like. Mm-hmm. So radioactivity is it? Pew 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 shooting is that what radioactivity is? Something shooting off of something? I read a lot about radioactivity. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. No, oh, wow. Especially nuclear nuclear so, energy. So there's the radiation. Okay. This is the confusing thing. There's radiation that comes off of radioactive things, and something that's radioactive is. I think all it's really saying is that like. There are waves. There are there are there's emissions coming off of this thing, um, but I think that in general, when we say radioactive, we mean things that are um, emitting particles, like actual pieces of of themselves. And when that happens, they can actually decay into other elements. Okay, can we talk about how you said "Oh wow" after I said I read about it and couldn't make heads or tails of it? <laughs> <laughs> look you know about vampire diary you said the thing i well, said no, i was right yeah. it's not yeah it's not uh that's that's the that's i, I wasn't oh wowing you i was oh wowing the like terminology mess that we got ourselves oh, okay. into because we okay. didn't really understand what was going on when we first started naming this stuff okay yes oh, yeah interesting that that is the big problem it's like depends on where you draw the circle because technically if you wanted to be stubborn about it you could mm-hmm. pr- claim that well, like, that, like so my many LED things. is radioactive yeah, right. because it's emitting lights. Is emitting a light bulb's radioactive because it's yeah. okay. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, because everything, to some extent, or a lot of things, are emitting small doses of radiation. So, like, and there's like a background radiation everywhere. Yeah, that there's cosmic that, yeah, radiation absolutely. in the universe. I'm radioactive both because I have potassium in me that has some 
unstable potassium, a little bit of unstable, but also because I am at infrared light hmm. because I'm warm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's nice. So where does this word come from that we're so confused about? Yeah, radioactivity. So I looked up radioactivity, but I assume radioactive is similar. Um, it's fairly recent, which is probably why we're so confused about it, because radioactivity comes from the French radioactivité, <laughs> which I think is like, uh, like just yeah. the same word, yeah. Which uh-huh. was made up by Pierre and Marie Curie in oh. 1898. They were like, yeah. what is this new element? They like they had some predecessors who had studied uranium and the the fact that it emits radioactive particles, but they were the ones to first use radioactivity as an adjective or a noun. Whatever part radioactive Whichever as an one. adjective. This is a science show. This is isn't a grammar <laughs> show. To describe what they were working on in uranium and polonium and radium, and they were like radioactivity is a property that these things have. Um, And further back than that, I tried to trace it. There are several different ways that we started incorporating like radio into words. And especially Mm. in recent history where like radio means the machine, the radio, and then we tack that onto words. But Mm. at this point, the, the use of radio in radioactivity came from the Latin radius, meaning ray. Oh, yeah. And so it okay. came more from the idea of a ray of light, a beam of light, and the the emission property of it hmm. to get into that, like the, the radiantness of it, as opposed to the straight rod in the middle of a circle. It's a little bit frustrating to me that that a light is radiation. Now, I I, I know that that's ridiculous, um, but it does seem like we we got this word that uh, turned bad. You know, mm-hmm. at first it was like this is interesting, and then it was like this is cool. This and then it, this is good. We should shine it into our eyeballs. <laughs> and then it was like actually it's terrible. We should be terrified of it. And that has lasted a long time. And now people sort of like radiation is synonymous with ionizing, dangerous, cancer-causing radiation. Whereas it's sort of important to realize we we also get to, like, people use that word for visible light. It was going to be a Halloween topic, but then I moved it up a little bit because it's (laughs) scary. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you can definitely make a uh, Hulk a giant with it. A giant ant, yeah. a giant mantis, giant mm-hmm. octopus. Spider. Really take you your pick. Spider giant person. spider. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's going to be time to go into the quiz portion of our show where we're going to be playing uh, radio radioactivity this or that. So our bodies are constantly uh, interacting with radiation. That's coming from space, from materials found on Earth, from things that we make. And the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements estimates the average person in the U.S. experiences around uh, 6.2 millisieverts per year. So about half of that is from natural background radiation, and the other half is from man-made things like medical stuff, industrial sources. Fortunately, this amount of radiation does not seem to do us very much harm. Researchers have measured the radiation doses we experience from a variety of sources, so today we're going to be playing this or that radioactive edition, where I will present to you two things, and you will have to guess which one is more radioactive. Ooh. Radioactive. <laughs> <Yeah>. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so first we're going to start out with medicine. Which one of the following things requires a larger dose of radiation? An x-ray of your chest or a CT scan of your chest? Couldn't tell you what a CT scan is exactly. <laughs> a cat scan. That's what oh. they call it. Yeah, it's a cat scan. Okay. Now I know at least what the word is, but I'm still not really sure what that does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's understandable. <sighs> You're not old enough to, to need to know all the medical things that happen. Uh. <laughs> Your body hasn't just, broken down yet. <laughs> yeah. I just read a, a biography of Antoine Lavoisier, the guy who uh, basically sort of invented the modern concepts of how chemistry works. And mm-hmm. as he was uh, in his little uh, cell getting ready to be put to death oh, no. uh, in the, during the French Revolution, he wrote a letter to his cousin and it said, something to the effect of at least i have been spared the indignities of old age <laughs> <laughs> that's nice he was putting a good spin on it yeah, yeah he was like hey, getting old kind of sounds like it's awful hard anyway i don't want to have to learn with a ct scan <laughs> yeah. all right i guess it's probably ct scan because x-ray i feel like it's like this is the the trick it's a trick question basically. that's what i think too i think it's a ct scan because i 
I think it takes longer. I feel like an x-ray, you just mm. go, Bleh. You get x-rays at the dentist, even in your chest. You could probably do it pretty fast. Well, you are correct. And all the people who know about medicine were screaming the answer to you because CT CT scans are actually just a bunch of x-rays. Oh, yeah. So you take take x-ray images from a lot of different (laughs) angles, and that requires, obviously, a larger radiation dose than a single x-ray would. Oh, that's fun. Uh, Yeah, so they they both produce ionizing radiation. Uh, That involves high-energy wavelengths that allow the particles to penetrate the tissue. And a chest x-ray has an average radioactive dose of 0.1 millisieverts. A CT scan of the chest has an average radiation dose of 7 millisieverts. And we get 6 per year normally? Is that what you said? We got 6.2 a year. That's right. Okay. So, yeah, you only get a CT scan if you need one. Okay. That's for sure. It's like 70 70 little chest x-rays going pew, 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 pew. And the radiation that doesn't get absorbed in these things, that's the stuff that makes it through and produces the final image. And the doctors use these effective dose values to understand the risk that the procedures might pose to the body overall and to Mm. balance that with the potential benefits of using these scans. Round number two We've moved from medicine to travel. Which of the following exposes airline passengers and crew to more radiation, a flight from Frankfurt to San Francisco, or a flight from Hong Kong to Hartford? Hong Kong to Hartford? Gosh. Frankfurt to San Francisco. I feel like the poles have something to maybe like, I don't know. You're going over (laughs) the top or something. I'm going to guess Hong Kong to San Francisco because... You can't. You got to guess Hong Kong to Hartford. (laughs) <laughs> to <a hot> <laughs> I'm going to guess Hong Kong to Hartford uh, because just to, I, I can't logic through it. This is beyond what I can do. So uh, the worst, the best I can do is guess. So as you have correctly surmised, space uh, is a source of radiation. There's X, X-rays, there's high energy particles, there's gamma rays, and they also react with our atmosphere and create secondary radiation that can reach us. And while you fly, you are at a higher altitude, and that means you're less shielded from all that radiation. There are other factors that impact the amount of radiation that flyers experience as well, like the duration of their flight, of course, Mm -hmm. and also the distance from the equator, which makes Mm -hmm. a difference because of how Earth's magnetic field pushes radiation towards the poles. Good job, Sam. Sam. You were right, but you still got the wrong answer. Well, I wasn't sure where any of those places were exactly, so that was a problem. (laughs) So, in 2016, researchers used models of solar activity and its effect on the energy of particles impacting the Earth to estimate the average radiation doses that uh, different passengers would experience on different flight routes. And with their model, they calculated that on average, a passenger from Frankfurt to San Francisco experiences an average dose of 70.7 microsieverts, Mm. not millisieverts, so even smaller, mm-hmm. while a passenger from Hong Kong to Hartford experiences 93.2 microsieverts. And in general, they found that the highest dosage flights were ultra long haul flights between US and Asia, a lot of those, and above the halfway point between the equator and the North Pole. I'm surprised that you could go from Hong Kong to Hartford. It's Hartford. Yeah. yeah. No offense to Hartford. <laughs> the Hartford International Airport, you know? Yeah. Can, can, can you really do that? We can not We can go to like four places from Missoula. Yeah. They can go to Hong Kong. That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair at all. And our last section of this or that, it's, a, it's, it's the food edition. Which one of the following has more radiation? One kilogram of beer or one kilogram of bananas? Uh, beer, bananas. Beer, I don't know. We talked about like whiskey barrels having r- the nuclear bomb radiation in them or whatever so i'll just go with beer do you put beer in barrels i don't know no you don't <laughs> <laughs> some people must i feel like i watched an old popeye yeah, I'm sure car- they used to. i feel like yeah. i watched a popeye cartoon where beer was in a barrel with the with the xx whatever on it <laughs> yeah. and it yeah. blows it out of the barrel or isn't that what isn't that what dumbo's drinking out of barrels or something oh, like I don't that know. <laughs> well what do you think i think it's bananas because of the potassium but yeah, i don't know what else is in that, beer but... beer is like a lot of carbs and water and i don't think that's very radioactive sari is right damn it's it, it is just it's a lot of carbs and water <laughs> <laughs> but all of our foods to some degree have some radioactivity in part because of carbon isotopes and there's going to be carbon in anything you eat but there is also other elements like uh potassium 40 or radium 226 the units used to report these values are in picocuries per kilogram where a picocurie describes the amount of ionizing ra- radiation released when an element goes through radioactive decay and emits energy so in the case of 
of bananas versus beer. Bananas have around 3,520 picocuries per kilogram, and beer has 390. Luckily, the amount of radiation from a banana doesn't really add up to very much when we eat them. However, the radioactivity of bananas has inspired an unofficial radioactivity scale called the banana equivalent dose mm. to describe the radiation exposure in terms of bananas, where one BED equals 0.1 <laughs> microsievert. Scientists love having fun. That's right. <laughs> All right, Sam, you have one point, and Sari has three going into the break. Next, we're going to take a short break, and then it'll be time for the fact off. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for the fact off. Our panelists have all brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge and award them Hank Bucks any way I see fit. To decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. The fungus Cladosporium spherospermum seems to thrive <laughs> in the presence of radiation. So naturally, research sent a sample to space, monitoring it for 30 days aboard the International Space Station. Their experiments demonstrated that a 1.7 millimeter thick bed of fungus could lower mm -hmm. radiation levels in the area by 2.17% compared to an area that wasn't shielded by the fungi. Based on their results, the researchers estimated how thick of a layer of cladosporium they would need to create Earth-like conditions on Mars. How thick would this fungus blockade need to be? What in what units do you want? Uh, let's do feet. Oh, feet. feet. Oh, sorry. I, should, I gave maybe I gave something away. <laughs> that's, a, that's big. Uh, yeah, I was gonna get it wrong. By also, <laughs> meters would be fine. Okay, I'm imagining swaddling myself in a blanket of fungus. <laughs> what would make nice. me feel safe on Mars? I think 20 feet. Oh, that's a lot. Okay, I'm gonna say two meters. It's just dang mushrooms. <laughs> Sari says two meters. It's 2.3 meters. Wow. I, my mental, my mind palace did me well. <laughs> <laughs> Just picturing to be, being enveloped by two, two meters of fungus. fungus on every side. Yeah. And do I feel safe now? <laughs> yes. I the feel safe yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way to feel safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just as long as you have a snorkel. Yeah. Yes. Right. A straw to <laughs> breathe out. <laughs> So that means you get to decide who goes first. Sam, you can go first. Oh, no. I'm taking okay. the coward's way out. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> the Boy Scouts of America, just for those of you out there who don't know, is a youth organization devoted to teaching kids junk like tying knots, catching fish, identifying plants, whittling, good forest-based activities that all blue-blooded American children ought to know. Uh, when you get good enough at these things and pass some tests, you get a little badge to put on your sash, and those with many badges are most esteemed among Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. But in addition to your more traditionally outdoorsy array of badges, there are some weird ass badges like dentistry or fingerprinting or one that indirectly led to a Michigan scout's backyard being declared a super fun site, Atomic Energy. David Hahn, a Boy Scout, was awarded the Merit Badge in Atomic Energy in 1991 after completing some rudimentary tests and projects like building a model of a nuclear reactor with cans and straws and household items. Uh, but David Hahn was also a naturally born scientist and had been studying chemistry since he was 10, inspired by the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, which was given to him by his grandpa. Uh, and he had spent the intervening four years doing things like learning how to make nitroglycerin and blowing up his bedroom numerous <laughs> times. <laughs> to the point where he had been exiled to his backyard as kind of like his little laboratory where he was doing his chemistry experiments. So David, at this point, was a bit drunk off the power of chemistry and decided that he didn't just need to leave his exploration of nuclear power at a mere model. Uh, so he started sending out letters to various nuclear energy organizations, <laughs> including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, posing as a high school teacher and asking for educational material to use in his classes, like where uh, in the natural and man-made world one could find radioactive material. <laughs> and they sent him all kinds of info back, enough that he eventually figured out that uh, he could create purified thorium out of parts of gas lanterns combined with lithium from $1,000 worth of batteries. So he just poured lithium on this. Uh, <laughs> then he put a Geiger counter on his car's dashboard and drove around town finding all of the radium he could from old watch faces and instrument panels and used that to irradiate his thorium, which uh, he then 
combined with americium 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 oh shoot i wasn't even close (laughs) (laughs) which is what's in smoke detectors that makes them detect smoke it's new it's radioactive as well and he built a breeder reactor which i don't entirely understand what a breeder reactor is or how it works but it's a reactor that can somehow make more fissile material than it uses And they were a major source of interest of nuclear scientists in the 50s, but a couple of the major experimental breeder reactors ended in near meltdown, so they lost popularity. Uh, But Mm. David made one, and it worked. (laughs) But it started working too well, so well that radiation was becoming detectable up and down his block, so he took the reactor apart and hid it in his car trunk. But in a case of weird mistaken identity, a cop ended up searching his trunk for something not even related to him, basically, and ran across the reactor and started messing with it. And David said, I wouldn't do that. That's radioactive. (laughs) Then uh, a few days later, flash flash forward a few days later, the FBI, the EPA, and the NRC are in David's backyard detecting background radiation 50 times higher than normal background radiation. And ultimately, his shed was declared a super fun site, dismantled, sealed in barrels, and buried in the Utah desert desert alongside material for <laughs> nuclear bomb testing and, a, and all of this after he had already gotten his merit badge so the lesson is as story editor alex billow put it when i sent him this story there is such <laughs> thing as trying too hard <laughs> <laughs> oh don't i know it <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing i'm not sure what my favorite part is <laughs> The part where he drove around with a Geiger counter on his dashboard so he could find radium watch faces. Yeah, that and apparently that worked. That seemed like it was a bit of a ostentatious like move on his part, but yeah. it actually accidentally did end up working out because he passed an antique store and it like went crazy. And then he found an old clock oh, and inside yeah. of the old clock, he found a vial of radium that had been left so he could like touch up the the clock face. Oh wow. And that was what he used mostly to to oh, shoot his cool. thorium with. But I think probably the best, best part is that they buried his shed in the desert. <laughs> I think that's my favorite part, too. <laughs> they put it in barrels and took it away and put it in the desert. I like the email or the, the sending letters to the government yeah. pretending to be a teacher. That is like... also very good. <laughs> All right, Sari, what do you have to compete with uh, Nuclear Boy? So certain radioactive isotopes of elements have an ominous nickname. They're bone seekers. They tend to accumulate in our bones if they get into the human body somehow. So, Uh for example, strontium-90 is in the same periodic table group as calcium, so one of the columns, and acts chemically similar to it. This radioactive form has 38 protons, like a stable strontium atom, but what makes it an isotope is it's whopping 52 neutrons. Um, And in the late 1950s and early 1960s, as nuclear testing was ramping up and isotopes like strontium-90 were getting released into the environment as waste products, there was a lot of curiosity about how much people were getting affected by them. What's happening here? Uh, So the physician, Louise Rice, along with her husband and some other scientists, mostly environmental scientists, led a project where she was basically the tooth fairy but in a scientific way oh, and by that I, I, that's a great i was like are they gonna are they gonna grave rob no it's, are they gonna grave rob it's much that's not allowed. Than grave robbing. Uh, and by that i mean her team collected and analyzed thousands of baby teeth from kids in the st louis missouri area in the u.s for their strontium 90 content because Why it's a bone not? seeker they're around yeah. there's plenty of teeth we're not doing anything with all these teeth uh-huh yeah why I keep them that's creepy it's so much easier than grave <laughs> they just gotta yeah, get in touch with home. the tooth fairy and be like yeah, here's a grant and so in a massive public outreach effort rice's team visited schools and other community centers and explained to families how strontium 90 from nuclear tests could make its way into human bones by being sprinkled into water or dairy products and then making its way into food and that mm-hmm. the kids are eating and they talk and then to- it seeks your bones yeah it seeks your bones and gets in there and just makes a little home uh swaddling itself up in the rest of the bone like me and the fungus and <laughs> they talked to caregivers for consent and spread scientific literacy which is honestly very exciting to be able to uh-huh. say about an old science experiment really <laughs> it seems ethically sound yeah. uh And families that wanted to participate sent in geographic information about where they've lived, their kids' baby teeth, and in return got a fun little button that said, I gave my tooth to science, which in my nerdy opinion is much more fun than a couple of Uh quarters. Well, get both, ideally. (laughs) After the 
first two years of analysis on over 65,000 teeth, Whoa. Rice published a paper on November 24th, 1961 in the journal Science and reported that they did find elevated levels of strontium-90, and therefore the stuff getting into the environment from nuclear tests was also getting into humans through children, but also adults, <laughs> presumably. And this yeah. paper along with some testimony from her husband in front of the Senate, helped influence the U.S. government to sign on to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in hmm. 1963. That's but awesome. was still plenty of tooth research to do. This team kept collecting baby teeth from St. Louis kids through 1970 and ended up with around 325,000 teeth in total. Wow. Uh, and further analysis led to findings like children born in 1963 had around 50 times as much strontium-90 as huh. children born in 1950, which was before for many, but not all nuclear tests. And so there was a pretty big difference. And the whole using teeth to study radioactivity thing stuck around, as later studies showed that strontium-90 in baby teeth decreased by around half in kids mm. born in 1968 after the treaty had been put into effect. And oh. so we had this like peak wow. around peak nuclear testing, and then the, the governmental policies, environmental policies really did help people be less radioactive. And even nowadays, the Baby Tooth Survey inspires other initiatives to detect various kinds of pollution that can end up in bones and impact human health. And it's very cool to me that this weird, wonderful collaboration between scientists and the public and a scary amount of teeth existed, and people were excited about it. That's wild. Um, three, hundreds of thousands of teeth is a significant uh, haul if you get them to the tooth fairy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, Fraud. is that part of the deal? Like, somebody's got to be funding the research. Is it the Tooth Fairy? Big Tooth. Could be. Tooth Big Fairy tooth. is very interested Big in <laughs> this niche field of research. <laughs> I like the idea that there's a bunch of Tooth Fairies and a lot of them are, like, independent like operators they have small businesses yeah. but then there's like one that's like sort of rolled them all up it's like a corporate bit it's called yes. big tooth yes gosh i thought i thought sam had it in the bag yeah, this one's pretty good though and she got three points so let's just say that sam got a hundred points in the first section and sarah got 300 points in the first section oh, okay i'm just I, I just feel like i need more Scaling more decimal places yeah. to work with yeah here. yeah um, and, and for these facts, I think that Sari's was probably like a 500 point fact and Sam's is like a 450 point fact, which are still, both are very high, but that's, but I got that's, more than Sam and yeah. both that leads me to believe that Sari is the winner of the episode. <sighs> wow. They, they ground up hundreds of thousands of teeth. I also have never really reckoned with just how many teeth are out there. Like, this was their 12 <laughs> years of actively collecting with people's consent. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah it's not... It, it, it's it's by far not anywhere near the majority of the teeth. No. Though. It's a tiny fraction of the a, teeth. We're fighting about sand. Tooth <laughs> as a renewable resource. We keep making yeah. babies. We keep making teeth. Yeah. Someone needs to start... Communicating with the tooth fairy about these grants, about tooth? the research we can do. Tooth yeah, sand? I, I, is that what you're suggesting? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we gotta make be. concrete with it. Yeah. Oh. Look, if this is your first episode of SciShow Tangents, this is it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if you're wondering which episode to send to a friend, and you're like, well, I'd like to, people, more people to know. This is the one. Yeah. This is the one. This is the one that puts you over the edge. You're like, it's got a... a, a Imagine Dragon Song in it. <laughs> the first part's all about Vampire Diaries for some reason. Both of the fact yeah. off facts were just all, all, totally unhinged and amazing uh, human endeavors. Uh, but and the, and you're not even done yet because now it's time to ask the science couch where we ask a listener question to our finely honed virtual couch of scientific minds. James on Discord asks. How did we determine fatal dosages of radiation other than error? I'm hoping nobody trialed that. I think most of it is from people who have died from radiation exposure. So it's not like intentional trials in as much as no. like war is an intentional trial. Mm. Uh, but like one of the biggest um, research institutes for it. Uh, is the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, the RERF, which uh, is a collaboration between Japan and the United States. And a, a lot of what we know about lethal doses and cancer frequencies and stuff has been by studying long-term health records of the survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that 
at least in English language, is, is where most of what we know comes from as far as like risk to cancer, exposure to different amounts of radiation, LD50. Um, we study with radiation and specifically LD50 slash 30 is, is the figure I found a, a more than once. I don't know, um, which is uh, the dose of radiation expected to cause death to 50% of an exposed population within 30 days because radiation sickness has to set in. It's not like an immediate vaporization at the, the amounts that we have on Earth. That makes sense. And um, the, the ability uh, of people to take the opportunity to continue to learn uh, is pretty... That it's it seems like the right thing, uh, especially because like it's not like we are done with radiation on the planet. Mm-hmm. So and also like it, it, it's a super important thing when it comes to space travel. Like it, it's just right. I guess you could swaddle yourself in fungus, but we don't have uh, solutions to all of those problems yet. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on Discord. Thank you to Buns on Discord, <laughs> at Boy with Headache, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. Did you laugh at the way I said Buns? No, I just <laughs> laughed because of Buns. I love <laughs> Buns both at the way you said it and the name Buns. <laughs> If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents to become a patron and get access to things like our newsletter and our silly little bonus episodes. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show, and also it helps other people learn about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell tell people people about about us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon, of course. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. The Hanford site in the U.S. churned out radioactive plutonium during the 1940s, during the Manhattan Project, and is now a huge government cleanup project. Ongoing efforts involve searching for radioactivity with detectors mounted on helicopters so they can monitor for any unexpected leaks and waste can be disposed of safely. Now, rabbits or other small wildlife can burrow into contaminated areas without realizing it and lick up the radioactive salts. And because uh, what goes in must come out, they leave radioactive poop piles across eastern Washington. And that poop is radioactive enough to get picked up by these detectors and become one more thing that needs to be cleaned up. Although it is apparently not a top priority. Just looking for the big spills, and then it's a little rat. Ah, man, Jim, it's another rat poop. It's another freaking rat poop.